the four NASA execs who participated in this trip to Antarctica included not only Werner von Braun, director of NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, but also Dr. Robert R. Gilruth, director of the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston, Dr. Maxime Faget, Houston's director of engineering and development, and another former Nazi scientist, Dr. Ernst Stuhlinger, head of the research project laboratory at the Marshall Space Flight Center, four of the most handsomely paid directors in all of NASA. In most sectors of corporate America, a trip of this sort is typically called a boondoggle. If there was any ulterior motive for the trip, it was to put the Texas and Alabama boys together on what was then a multi-day round trip flight and get them to iron out their petty differences, as was proposed in Von Braun's biography, Dreamer of Space, which also makes no reference to meteorites. The full title of the book is Von Braun, Dreamer of Space, Engineer of War. I find it interesting how Webb omitted the latter portion of the book's title, which is obviously a nod to Von Braun's World War II days. Sounds to me like Webb is ashamed to bring up Werner von Braun's Nazi background. Call him a Nazi, he won't even frown. A Nazi schmazi, says Werner von Braun. As for Antarctica, the expedition in question is discussed on pages 414 and 415 of the book. While it makes no mention of meteorites, it also makes no mention of the trip being a vacation for the four NASA directors. It purely describes the expedition as being for scientific purposes. It also makes no mention of putting the Texas and Alabama boys together to iron out their petty differences other than a brief, vague quotation from George Muller, which is pretty open to interpretation. The author goes on to write this about the two former Nazis who took part in the expedition. Von Braun and Stuhlinger did not take the most direct approach to Christchurch, New Zealand, the staging base for US Antarctic operations, but made overnight stops in Hawaii, Tahiti, Bora Bora, and Fiji, apparently as kind of a mini vacation. Either in Fiji or on arrival in Christchurch on New Year's Day 1967, they rendezvoused with Gilruth and Faget. Two days later, the four left in a Navy 4 engine constellation. Von Braun promptly talked his way into the co-pilot seat and flew most of the way to McMurdo Station near the Ross Ice Shelf. One can only guess that Webb is trying to imply that the visit to Antarctica was part of that mini vacation. It wasn't. Nowhere in Dreamer of Space, Engineer of War, is it implied that the trip was part of that mini-vacation. The two pages that the book spends on the expedition are pretty much nothing more than a summary of what was written in the popular science article. In part B of his video, he goes on to describe this trip as a one-week working vacation. But that's not what the source material says. The same material he praised earlier as coming from an intelligent young truth seeker. Why would Webb falsely imply that Von Braun's scientific expedition to Antarctica was part of his brief side cellar vacation in all the Sunshine Resorts? Unless, of course, Webb did not have full confidence in Von Braun's official claim that he went to Antarctica to determine if the continent was suitable for lunar field testing and training. In other words, Webb has confirmed that the official reason for the trip is bogus and that NASA sources can't be trusted. Hey, I think we're getting somewhere, don't you? Now although Webb made this two-part video in response to the claim that Von Braun went to Antarctica to gather meteorites, in part B he goes off on various tangents that lead to off-topic discussions. These include meteorites not found in Antarctica, the total number of official lunar meteorites, etc etc. He also rehashes many spurious claims that we debunked in previous videos. So we apologize in advance if the remainder of this video seems to delve into off-topic discussions. If they were to fake the moon landings and there were some people in there and, uh, that, that were going to do this, why would they send Von Braun? to Antarctica. Why would they take pictures of Von Braun and then why would they say, look, Von Braun went to Antarctica. Why even do that? If this is going to be a secret thing and you're going to go to Antarctica to collect rocks, um, it doesn't make sense to send your rocket There's engineer. a lot of things that don't make sense, but the fact is he was in Antarctica. He did bring back moon rocks.
They brought back some meteorites from the moon. Um, they didn't bring. I don't think they brought back hundreds of pounds. From they what brought I'm back hundreds here. of pounds. If you find it, it's it's available all over the place. Uh, Joe Rogan is quite the master debater, but Plate is absolutely right in that it doesn't make sense to send a legendary rocket scientist like Horner von Braun to collect meteorites. Unfortunately, on this February 23, 2007 airing of the Pendulet radio show, Joe Rogan was in the studio and Phil Plate called in from home with his trusty internet handy. When Joe brought up the von Braun trip, which Plate obviously had never heard of before, and Plate googled Warner von Braun in Antarctica, he was probably inundated with hundreds of illegitimate references to the trip as a meteorite hunting expedition. I'm willing to bet Plate was very well aware of the Von Braun subject during this Pendulet radio show. He echoed many, many things from Jay Windley's website, like his claim that Antarctica was not known to have meteorites until the Japanese went there in 1969. Why would you send your rocket scientists? I don't know, but he was there. I don't know, but he was there. He brought back rocks. Second of all, um, it was he was there in 1967 or 1968. It wasn't until 1969 that Japanese scientists first identified Antarctica as having a lot of meteorites. So it doesn't make sense that. You know, if he went there two years before, it was even understood that meteorites went there. I don't know why he went there. I don't think it was to pick up meteorites. And even if he did, that wouldn't have been enough time for them to prepare these rocks uh, and, and get them to How make it look that? like Neil Armstrong put them up. There's How not enough time that? because the rocks that come from the moon look very different than the lunar meteorites that are found on the surface of the Earth. Right. The point is the meteorites look different that came from the, or excuse me, the meteorites that come from Antarctica look different than the moon rocks. They, they re-entered through the Earth's atmosphere and so they have uh, the ones that have what's been called fusion crust there. on them. To this day, I suspect that Plate was being coached during the interview. Probably had Jay Windley in one ear or had little printouts of his website at hand. Another problem is that the whole story doesn't fit with NASA's supposed modus operandi. If they wanted to find something in Antarctica to pass off for moon rocks, they would have sent a couple of expert geologists, leaders in their field, someone who might possibly know what they were looking at. Then, when they returned, NASA would have taken the rocks and assassinated the geologists, cleaning up all the loose ends. That's what Casing would have said. It looks as though Webb has pulled the same tactic as Plate. This statement was lifted directly from Jay Windley's site. Although Von Braun went to Antarctica in 1967, this assertion is still implausible. Why would Von Braun be the person to do this? An engineer with a brilliance for the design of propulsion and guidance systems would not necessarily have the expertise to recognize and recover meteoritic lunar samples. That would require a geologist, and NASA certainly had access to some very competent geologists. It doesn't require a geologist to find meteorites in Antarctica. Meteorites are easily recognizable as charred lumps of rock. As stated in Apollo Zero, in the vastness of the Antarctic wasteland, due to the contrast of the landscape, meteorites are easier to spot there than, say, California or Texas where the meteorites blend in more easily with the scenery. NASA's website even confirms this ease. Antarctica is a good place to find meteorites, or rocks that fell from space to Earth. Scientists find more meteorites in Antarctica than any other place in the world. Meteorites are easier to see on the white ice. Also, meteorites that fall to Antarctica are protected by the ice for a long time. While it is true that a Japanese expedition did manage to retrieve nine meteorite samples in 1969, their discovery wasn't a total surprise, because explorers had been finding meteorites in Antarctica since 1912, the year von Braun was born. To imply that Antarctica was not known to haven meteorites until 1969 is just plain wrong. The operative word here is a few. The Wikipedia article states that a few meteorites were found in Antarctica. A few. Not a bunch. Not a veritable gold mine. Just a few. Between 1912 and 1964. How many is a few? Well, to answer that question, we have to take a short trip outside Wikipedia. I hope you don't mind.
to the Meteoritical Society website. Between 1912 and 1964, a total of four meteorites were discovered in Antarctica. Now, the first was an ordinary chondrite, an L5, followed by a palisite, which is a rare type of stony iron meteorite, and two iron meteorites, none of which resemble moon rocks at all. None of which resemble moon rocks at all? This is not entirely accurate. Yes, we established previously that ordinary chondrites have chemical compositions and mineralogy different to the Apollo samples, but they do have oxygen isotope ratios within the same range as Apollo samples and earth rocks. Still, I never claimed that ordinary chondrites were the types of meteorites used. But Webb also ignores the fact that traces of iron meteorites, like the two that were found in Antarctica, were found amongst the regular samples. The fact that they had four documented discoveries of meteorites in Antarctica, six if you count the other two that carry unknown dates, is a good indication that meteorites can be found there. Remember, Antarctica is a very good place to find meteorites because of the contrast with the landscape. Couple this with the fact that the ice in sub-zero temperatures helps to preserve the rock and protect it from weathering. Now, that's not to say that meteorites collected from other parts of the globe were not used. Just that those from Antarctica have the added bonus of being in a more pristine condition than their counterparts collected from the more warmer areas of the Earth. Meanwhile, searching for meteorites not found in Antarctica during that time period, 93 were found between 1912 and 1917 alone, and over half of those were found in either Texas or California. But why send von Braun to Antarctica when he could have picked up meteorites on a trip to Houston, Texas, or Goldstone, California? Maybe because meteorites are easier to spot in Antarctica than those from California and Texas? Because those from Antarctic wastelands are not as eroded away into the Earth as those from California and Texas? Again, this is not to say that I ever claimed that Antarctica was the only place where NASA retrieved their Apollo samples from. In Exhibit D, I simply said you can find meteorites there, and von Braun was present in Antarctica during a time when meteorites were known to exist in Antarctica. Besides which, even if Antarctica was not confirmed to contain vast quantities of meteorites, high school physics alone should be a perfect indicator that they were there. Webb likes to pause his videos to ask his viewers what would he do if he was a conspirator. I'll take a moment to pause the video and do the same. Let's pretend that it is 1966. We are planning to fake a mission to the moon. Obviously, as part of my phony evidence for such a visit, I would need to bring back photos and videos of the trip and physical material that one can collect up there. Photography and video can all be done in a set or on location in the desert. Take your pick. As for the moon rocks, since no one else has ever seen or handled a moon rock, whatever I present to the world would automatically become the standard. Earth basalts are easy to get, but they lack the one thing that the moon is likely to have due to its lack of an atmosphere, evidence of having been bombarded by solar and cosmic radiation, which we have previously seen in meteorites previously collected. Granted, we can freely get meteorite samples closer to home, but wouldn't we also want to, if not prefer to, use some more pristine specimens? Specimens that have not been constantly damaged by wind or rain and temperature variations? That's a plus for sure. So where would be the likely place to find such specimens? Applying our brain power and common knowledge tells us that the Earth's polar regions are likely to preserve these relatively undamaged specimens. After all, photos from lunar orbiter indicate that the lunar poles are covered with craters, meaning that it has been constantly bombarded by meteorites. Why would the Earth have not experienced the same abuse? Plus, Given how widespread meteorites are across the states, it's logical that they would be widespread across Antarctica too. Not to mention the fact that we already have six meteorites on record as having been found there. And given that we have these four samples, we can compare them to samples from Texas and California and see just how considerably more well-preserved the Antarctica samples are. 
Consider also, Antarctica is not as populated by life as the Arctic, and thus the specimens found in Antarctica would be more pristine than those in the Arctic. What say we send some guys down there to systematically search the ice for such samples? We can tell the public that the trip was simply for testing field equipment. Enough said.